webinar. So I, I will welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining for today's webinar for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So my, my name is Alessandro Voz. I'm a principal engineer at Microsoft and I'm a CNCF ambassador. So I'm your host for today. Uh, we're gonna have a, a interesting webinar um, uh, presented by Gadi Naor, CTO and co-founder uh, at Alcid. So just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, so first of all, uh, unfortunately you cannot talk during the webinar, so please just listen in. And there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if there's, a, if there's any question for, uh, for Gadi, uh, please put it there and I'm gonna read at the end of the webinar. So you have to hold on until the end. We're gonna leave 15 minutes at the end to answer your, your questions. Um, very important, this is an official CNCF uh, webinar, so we have to adhere to the, to the code of conduct of uh, the Cloud Native Foundation, so please refrain from using uh, inappropriate language. Uh, please respect everybody, and please respect the participant and the, the presenter. Well, so done the housekeeping. Now I'll give the, 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 the word to Gadi. If you're ready to present. I am gone. ready, thank you, thank you. So hello everyone, and uh, absolutely thank you for joining uh, me. This is my first webinar for the year, so uh, very excited to do this. And in this webinar, we are going to cover Kubernetes audit log and kind of dive into uh, why this is a gold mine for um, security. So. To briefly kind of uh, introduce myself, uh, my other obsession other than Kubernetes and security is skateboarding. Um, I was born and raised in Tel Aviv, uh, Israel. And throughout my kind of most of my career, I spent as a kernel developer um, at companies like Checkpoint, uh, building firewalls, VPNs, and, and all those things that are um, kind of uh, less feel about cloud native um, and then kind of uh, moved into a startup that built distributed firewalls on, on a VMware um, kernel um, and spent a more, few more years at Juniper Networks um, doing cloud um, security. And at some point of time, I think I got upgraded to do cloud native um, work and Kubernetes was kind of the main work around that. And presently, I'm the CTO and, and one of the founders of um, Alcid, which pretty much is a company that is purely focused on security end-to-end um, -end as a whole. So just a moment before um, I dive into kind of uh, Kubernetes audit log and why does it matter to kind of look into that, um, I want to set the stage in terms of like, what does it mean uh, or where this uh, piece of the puzzle falls in terms of the entire um, security of our Kubernetes clusters. So um, in a normal kind of constellation, we will see um, our pipelines, um, CI and CD, and these are kind of two completely beasts. Um, normally with CI, we would do um, the source scanning and then we will build them into containers. Um, if we did a good job, then the image scanning wouldn't find a lot of issues. And if we did kind of uh, um, not as, as good as job as, as it can be done, uh, we pretty much find ourselves um, sifting through a lot of vulnerabilities that are part of you know, operating systems and a lot of stuff that doesn't need to be in a container. And once we bake those artifacts, we pretty much wrap them together with Kubernetes configuration files. Normally we will do that using um, subsystems like Helm, or Terraform or a combination of, of scripting and, and templating. But at the end of the day, we pretty much deploy those assets into our target cluster. And at this point of time, and I will touch that briefly and later, um, the resources go through what in Kubernetes language is the admission phase. Um, it's pretty much allows to kind of inspect the resources before they are introduced into the cluster. Um, this is a very important point in time where you can uh, apply some security policies um, on top of the security policies that you do during the CD. And 
all of this is pretty much relates to the hygiene of the Kubernetes cluster. And as you move into kind of uh, the, the workloads themselves and the underlying infrastructure, we do want to make sure that from a runtime perspective, we pretty much employ um, network security and, and process level security on whatever is running inside the cluster. Now, uh, when I'm referring to whatever is running inside the cluster, um, the first thing we want to take care of is our applications. But just as important, we want to take care of the entire pod as a whole, which is pretty much our vehicle for our um, application containers. And we don't want to forget kind of taking care of the host itself. And when we try to think about what is the third component or, or the, the, the last component that we want to make sure we cover is pretty much the audit log, which captures all the API interactions or invocations made by users or by um, automated services that are running inside our cluster. And we can do a lot of kind of, um, um, or specific kind of um, actions and, and, and learn from, from the audit stream. Um, and this, this is going to be uh, the focus of um, this session. So if we kind of take a, um, a deeper step into what this Kubernetes API server means. So essentially um, the API server is kind of the brain uh, or at least um, a very important uh, piece of the brain of the cluster. So if we think about the Kubernetes control plane that runs the cluster, every request that is being submitted to the um, API server, it basically goes through kind of four stages. The first one, is pretty much um, the authentication. We want to establish the identity of whoever, uh, in that perspective, the principal that actually would like to perform an action or request against the cluster. Um, at this point, the uh, request processing will switch over to the authorization stage. So essentially, at this stage, we determine whether the established identity or, or whoever is trying to perform an action against the cluster um, is allowed to perform this action. This is specifically something that we configure using all those um, RBAC configuration um, as part of our provisioning of the cluster resources themselves. And if we pass this gate, the resource is basically submitted to the admission controlling phase where we basically perform two main actions within this stage. First one is kind of mutating. So there are two types of admission controllers. Uh, we have mutating admission controllers that can essentially change the resource that we pretty much admit into the cluster. One good example here would be, uh, for example, in Istio, the injection of the sidecar is something that is being done using a mutating admission controller. If you think about, for example, um, tooling like, like secret injection, and, and such subsystems, you can implement those using mutating admission controllers. Once we pass this gate, we go through the validating admission controllers, which pretty much can say yay or nay based on um, compliance checks, um, hygiene checks, or any policy that we would like to kind of apply to the um, final version of the resource. And once we've done that, the resource will go through kind of a Kubernetes validation stage where we pretty much validate that the uh, fields and everything kind of conform to the expected layout of the resource. And from this point onward, this is something that is being admitted into the cluster. Now, the API calls that basically performs the entire kind of machinery that I described here, basically is basically captured by the API server. So if we try to kind of uh, ask ourselves like who needs access or who actually access the API server, we can see that because Kubernetes inherently or, or pretty much natively um, encompass the notion of, of operators and controllers and control loops, um, then we can pretty much break it down to kind of three main uh, pieces or, or, or groups. The first one is kind of human uh, operators. These are users um, that access the cluster. Normally this would be either using um, specially written uh, Kubernetes client using the client libraries that uh, the Kubernetes SDK offers, 
or it can be using the kube control um, command line or whether this is Helm that is deploying into the uh, cluster itself. The um, second group is basically captured by um, the system components. So for example, the kubelets that are running um, on the nodes and represent kind of the Kubernetes agents um, repeatedly or, or um, um, kind of continuously will probe the API server. For example, um, once they get an, a request to schedule a pod on the node, um, the kubelet will fetch from the API server the config maps and the secrets that are relevant to this pod. So there is an ongoing access being performed by the system components to pretty much maintain kind of the desired state or the expected state um, of the resources. Other good example would be um, every deployment that we uh, push into the cluster um, that kind of in, in a cascading event will fire up a replica set and the pods and the underlying pods are also um, accessing the cluster using special kind of uh, um, designated group. When we are looking at this kind of from the API server perspective and the last kind of uh, component or group is basically service accounts. These are service accounts that we provision uh, as part of the uh, deployment of resources where we grant certain workloads, certain permissions to do uh, against or, or to perform against the API server. Um, one good example would be for, uh, would be um, operators. So if you think about Prometheus, for example, um, this is normally kind of a privileged component. When I'm saying privilege, it's kind of with respect to which APIs um, it allows to kind of access the API server. And um, these are, these are, this is a type of other resources that require access from uh, the API server. So if we think about it, zoom out a little bit. So we have a growing number of components that access the API server. Now, based on kind of the notion that every API invocation may, made by those, um, let's call them role players or, or principal are being recorded by the API server. So effectively we have kind of a very large stream of data that is, is pretty much policy driven. So you can tweak uh, which kind of data flows uh, in those uh, event or how, how verbose those logs uh, can be. And we pretty much from a security standpoint would like to surface signals that are meaningful and, and, and actionable and we can use in our day-to-day -day kind of security operations of the cluster. So um, one of the main challenges is how, can, how do we crunch this raw data into meaningful insights inside the cluster? So a few examples, and, and we'll, we'll kind of dive into that deeper later on, um, is, is someone exploiting a vulnerability in my API server? Um, it can be a known API, uh, it, it can be a known vulnerability in the API server because we didn't upgrade the server um, in kind of uh, in time, uh, but it can be unknown vulnerability that pretty much leaves signals or traces inside the audit log itself. Um, it can be scenarios where um, stolen credentials from users or stolen tokens from service accounts are being exploited or used or abused inside the cluster. We want to detect those. Uh, we have instances of kind of compliance based checks. I mean, if someone um, kind of exec into a pod, this is something that, for example, an auditor or a compliance uh, from a compliance standpoint would like to keep track of. Um, and another example would be uh, if a component basically have a misconfiguration in the RBAC, um, this is something that leaves traces inside the audit log itself. So when we try to think about how do we get kind of the uh, audit stream, um, this is something that kind of is, is relatively a moving target when it comes to uh, the different versions of Kubernetes that you are using. So um, the Kubernetes native kind of approach, uh, which is still an alpha level API, it, it was introduced um, in, in version 1.13 is the ability to stream the audit log 
to audit things that uh, reside inside the cluster. It's a new resource that basically enables to register um, an audit log target. And the Kubernetes API server will kind of stream the uh, audit log to this API um, uh, web, to this uh, audit webhook. So essentially it enables us to kind of plug in um, an inspection point of the audit log that resides as part of the cluster. So you can think about it as something that you want to build to employ um, security analysis or, or, or misconfiguration analysis as part of your cluster security infrastructure. And if we take kind of a few more examples from, from uh, some of the cloud providers. So in, in GKE, for example, by default, um, there is an audit policy in place that basically stream the audit log to stack driver, which is kind of the built-in um, um, logging, uh, log shipping uh, service. In AKS, uh, you can leverage the uh, event hub to basically extract the Kubernetes audit log for external processing. And in uh, AWS EKS, uh, we pretty much leverage or enable kind of EKS to ship those audit logs to CloudWatch. And then by streaming them to Kinesis, uh, we can pretty much fetch those uh, logs in order to um, analyze them. So what those audit logs actually look like in, in, in practice? So um, this is kind of a trimmed down version. I didn't put all the fields uh, that basically are part of the uh, audit log. But as I mentioned earlier, Kubernetes has an audit policy that basically controls the verbosity of what exactly exists in each and every one of the uh, logs. So you can basically control, um, for example, whether the resource itself will be placed in line as part of the log audit, uh, the audit log itself. So one, one bad example would be uh, to configure the audit policy to um, place the objects, the resource themselves uh, of type secret, it's pretty much would be revealing your Kubernetes secret resources inside the audit log. And if you ship it to kind of external systems, you pretty much created kind of uh, a situation where you leak secrets um, in a similar fashion where, uh, why you don't want to leak secrets in kind of the console logs of your um, container or, or a pod. So essentially when we try to think about um, what exactly the components that we have in the audit log. So we, first of all, we have the resource type that a principal uh, or, or a service account is trying to access. And then we have, assuming this is a namespaced resource, we have the uh, namespace of the resource. And then we also get to see which verb, HTTP verb in, uh, for that matter, um, it's pretty much represents whether we are reading, whether we are listing, whether we are deleting or updating the resource. And then on top of that, we have a uh, few kind of pieces of information that are um, extremely valuable. Uh, the first one would be kind of the user, the established user identity as part of the authentication process. So essentially we can see here the username and the group uh, that the user is uh, kind of part of. And when we try to think about it from establishing profiles and, and, and understanding kind of the nature of, of API operation being performed against the cluster, this, these are very important features to track when we try to understand kind of who is doing what and, and figuring out this kind of entire picture. Uh, we have a couple of more um, items or, or fields in the audit log. Uh, the user agent basically represents the um, client, uh, something that identifies uh, the client version that uh, connects to the um, Kubernetes API server. So for example, um, if, I'm, if I'm accessing my uh, Kubernetes cluster from, uh, let's say the Google dashboard, then uh, essentially um, we will see kind of the user agent being embedded by the Google kind of API client as Google container engine. On top of that, we will see um, network information or network location from which the API um, invocation was made. Some of the fields that we see here um, can be spoofed by an attacker. So for example, 
the user agent is something that is quite easy to kind of um, um, pretty much spoof or, 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 or fake. And from that, because of that reason, we want to make sure that some of the fields that are not anchored by um, something that we trust, we want to treat them uh, with kind of the respected level of trust and, 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 and account for that in a way that we pretty much do not uh, associate a lot of kind of um, um, importance into those fields. And the last kind of um, um, portion is pretty much the API invocation decision, whether this is something that uh, was denied by the API server and, and all that. In the rest of the fields, we can pretty much see like error codes and, and kind of more specific data that we can uh, derive some, some insights. Just to give you a sense, like um, this was something that was uh, in the recent KubeCon, uh, Datadog had, had a really nice talk on uh, Kubernetes uh, audit log and how they basically monitor the audit log internally. And on a 2,500 um, cluster, um, um, the, the amount of audit logs per uh, per minute was was uh, 1,000 1, events per second, sorry, um, 1,000 events per second. So if you think about it, uh, this is relatively a very large amount of data that needs to be processed and digested. And because there are very important signals um, that actually reside in the data, it relatively requires some, some heavy lifting or at least some analysis to basically surface those insights from uh, those logs. So let's take a few uh, use cases as, as an example here. Uh, from a troubleshooting perspective, um, we can pretty much detect system failures based on error code uh, 401, for example, from nodes. So specifically, one example would be if kubelet on one of the nodes cannot connect to the API server, um, and we start to see kind of uh, a drift in the number of error codes that we see from resources that are part of the system uh, uh, nodes, then this is something that we can pretty much fire to the, to the SRE team to take down the nodes or drain them and, and make sure that uh, um, they can connect to the API server. Um, another thing that I less kind of would recommend uh, um, from a practical standpoint would be to check the uh, responsiveness of the API server by measuring what is the in-flight time or the mean time to response uh, time of the um, API server calls that, you, that we have. Um, let's take another example from uh, more of a security kind of standpoint. We think about our production clusters as kind of a closed environment, a well-gated environment. Um, so one of the um, kind of interceptions or, or, or uh, compliance kind of elements that we can plug into the audit log in our systems is the ability to trigger alerts when sensitive pods or in general, even all the pods in certain environments are being accessed. Um, some some use, uh, useful kind of uh, information Around that would be that for uh, PCI compliant kind of environments, uh, we would need to kind of keep an audit trail of who accessed the card data holder environment. So the audit log for that matter can be an excellent source of data to basically keep track as long as we kind of surface this, uh, those events uh, in the right time and kind of put them aside for an auditor to kind of inspect. Um, another example would be um, if we want to have some internal security guardrails built into our environments where production clusters are not being uh, either exec or proxied into a pods or even dumping logs uh, that, are, that may contain sensitive data, then this is something again that we can uh, pretty much leverage the audit log um, to help us with. And, it's very useful to kind of use that because it covers a lot of grounds uh, from that perspective. Another kind of deeper example uh, would be to kind of detect misconfiguration in our environment. So any, any kind of unauthorized access 
uh, to the cluster that basically is represented by um, a permission denied, for example, uh, return code from the API server is something that we can um, track and pretty much based on that, we can understand whether we have kind of um, errors in our environment or misconfiguration, or for example, this is something that represents kind of malicious activities um, against our API server. So there are always uh, kind of in, in, with that respect, anomalies that are, can be associated with misconfiguration. But on the other hand, this can be also someone um, kind of a threat actor that may be inside our cluster or breached one of our DevOps. He's trying to do operations that are not pretty much uh, part of the permissions that the breached component um, is allowed to. So those signals can be uh, kind of interpreted in, in, in multiple ways. And this is the reason why first we want to look at those signals and then having enough data to understand whether this is a misconfiguration or this is kind of a human mistake or kind of ruling in or out uh, the findings based on more kind of forensics data. Um, another example, which is relatively more related to kind of the, the human uh, link in, in, this in this kind of uh, um, role playing, when we think about our human operators, whether these are DevOps contractors or whoever have access uh, to the clusters, essentially if someone loses his credentials to the environment for whatever reason, and, and whether this is social engineering or all those kind of exotic methods to kind of extract um, credentials from, from human users, um, we can, for example, detect if the cluster is being accessed by the same principle from different countries or different ASNs in relatively short period, period of time. This is an unusual kind of way to work with your cluster. I mean, the idea here is that we can detect those events by analyzing the audit log looking at the source IP addresses, for example, that exist in the audit log. And by tracking those, we can understand whether this is something that kind of falls into this category. So we've talked a lot, a lot about what we should do with our audit log, but some of the uh, elements that audit log doesn't get us. So the first, the first thing is uh, if we want to check the hygiene of the resources. So for example, um, we want to make sure that we don't have pods that are running as privileged components, or we want to make sure that in our um, config maps, we don't see any API access keys or tokens or password or anything of that sort. So the, in my opinion, the wrong kind of way to approach that is to configure your API server to basically dump the resources themselves into the log, the audit log and running those inspections through the audit log. There are much simpler mechanisms to uh, perform that. Admission controllers would be one way of doing that or even just calling the API server, reading the resource or dumping the entire resources and running the scan against them. Um, the main reason for that, when you have kind of a growing number of nodes in your cluster or, or growing number of controllers in your clusters and then shipping all the resources themselves as all of those kind of automated components read and write stuff to the API server, you pretty much move a lot of data um, from Kubernetes server to the audit kind of uh, target. Um, another example, which I uh, kind of highlighted earlier, um, Performance monitoring, we want to use kind of the metrics that are available um, and exported by the API server itself through the uh, metrics endpoints and leverage Prometheus and Alert Manager or any monitoring solution that you have there to basically understand if there are performance related issues in, in our um, environment. You can use audit log to do kind of the second tier troubleshooting of issues just like we kind of uh, went over with system nodes being unable to connect to uh, the, the API server itself. Another element that the audit log doesn't cover um, is pretty much 
anything that related to the workload level protection. So anything that happens like uh, network access to the application uh, workloads or pods um, are not tracked by the audit log. And this is a story that the pods um, are not telling the API server. So for example, if there is a pod restart, it's not tracked by the API server logs or the audit log for that matter. It actually covered by um, the event uh, subsystem that basically captures life cycle events. Um, and this is not something that is covered by the API uh, server audit log. So let's try to take a look. I'm going to be brave here and, and try to see if uh, um, we can connect to a real system that kind of monitors uh, one of, one of uh, publicly facing clusters. Um, and naturally, it starts with a snap. So what I would like to show you a little bit is, so I hope the demo gods uh, will be with me. All right. So what I would like to show you is an example of real kind of uh, life scenario where um, this is an example here where the timeline that we see here pretty much captures uh, who accessed the cluster at what point of time and which principal basically um, access the environment. We can see that some of the principles are captured by or as um, IPs, meaning that they were not really authenticated against the API server. And some of the uh, principles are actually um, denoted as, as actual usernames in our system. Um, the interesting part here is that um, we can see that some of the IPs here are not IPs that we are using regularly. And one of the nice things that are built into the system is the ability to kind of crunch that crunch all the audit log data into kind of features and signals and, and, and kind of um, counters on all those different features that we have here. So I will switch over. This is kind of a very easy and go to kind of uh, um, um, dimension to look at the audit log uh, from which countries our Kubernetes cluster is being uh, accessed or at least uh, attempts to access the cluster. Um, so if you have any Kubernetes API server that is publicly or facing kind of uh, the internet. Um, so if you're pretty much using the default on um, AKS, GKE uh, or EKS, um, that's by default kind of the, uh, the reality. So you should know that your API servers are being probed constantly by internet scanners. Some of them are actually tailor-made for Kubernetes. So let's see if we actually have an example here. So um, as much as I can uh, share here, we don't have kind of um, an, an operation or a DevOps operation in France. And we can see here that the cluster was accessed uh, um, from France uh, recently. And if I'll scroll down, we can see kind of in, in, a, in a nice visualization uh, that pretty much captures uh, which IPs from which countries uh, access the API server. Now, the nice thing about this, uh, that I can basically pivot or pretty much focus the system on uh, the individual kind of access attempts being made from France. And you can see that once I filtered out the entire audit log into kind of uh, the dimension of an IP coming from France, you can see that that very same uh, IP was accessing the API server specifically. Um, this was uh, last night and the API server basically responded with uh, permission denied. I can also try to see and pretty much figure out that the origin of this uh, access attempt was trying to access uh, the API endpoint to read pods. And we can see that uh, the action itself is basically captured by the verb that we pretty much saw in the audit log. So crunching the data or the audit log stream and breaking it down to different dimensions and, and, and enriching them um, pretty much enables us to see uh, or pretty much rule out and understand if there is something wrong going on in our cluster or if everything is kind of in line with 
certain assertions or expectations about our environment. Um, just to give you kind of another example, uh, we can, for example, see um, based on the audit policy, who, for example, perform exec operations into the cluster itself. We can track it down so you can see that some of our automation system is basically accessing uh, the system for regular kind of operations. But because we pretty much captured those kind of uh, uh, rules in our policy, we can pretty much fire um, alerts or events to a Slack channel or whatever um, security tooling we have there to basically capture those events because this is something that as an internal practice, we make sure um, to kind of track and, and, and respond to. So with that in mind, just to kind of conclude um, what we covered here, um, Kubernetes, Kubernetes audit logs is, is pretty much, uh, the, the logs are, are incredibly valuable for both ops and security. And when we try to think about uh, what we can do with them, we can take a lot of advantage of those logs, but it does require some effort. Uh, we saw that uh, we can pretty much stream the audit log into kind of an analysis pipeline. Um, so streaming them or, acqu or, or acquiring the data source is uh, the effort around that at this point in time is, is not straightforward with all the managed Kubernetes uh, services that are out there. But on the other hand, um, this is something that over time, uh, once the APIs are maturing and will get kind of to V1, that this should be relatively easier to kind of uh, handle. Um, but I will say that crunching the data and performing the analysis will require using some tailor-made tooling that understands both kind of static exceptions or, or rule-based exceptions to whatever is flowing in the cluster, but detecting anomalies and understanding kind of uh, um, deviations from, from base profiles and all that is something that requires some, some AI to build and bake into the analysis uh, stream. And the other kind of uh, element is that we want to make sure that our audit policy balance the verbosity of whatever is happening inside the cluster. The audit log is an extremely verbose kind of channel or data source. And, and we want to make sure that we kind of tune the policy to make sure that we cover all of them. The, the use cases, the, the audit log can cover from both ops and security perspective are extremely wide. They can address both kind of regulated uh, environments like, like PCI uh, or HIPAA or, or similar kind of um, external regulations, but just as well, create some internal uh, policies and follow them and implement them using the audit log. You can kind of detect known and unknown exploits in the API server through monitoring and applying kind of uh, higher level analysis of the logs themselves. So this is kind of a very valuable uh, source of information for detecting kind of um, such breach attempts or even successful breach attempts. And all in all, we highly recommend kind of employing this data source as part of your security tool stack to cover this uh, audit log. So I think it pretty much wraps up uh, what I wanted to kind of share on the Kubernetes audit log. You can register for early access to uh, the audit log, uh, Alcid K audit, which basically will give you some of the dashboards that we saw, you saw earlier, or you can try um, our cloud service to do kind of some of the other Kubernetes security uh, challenges that are out there. And I think that at, that, at this point, uh, we can switch over to some questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Gadi. Uh, yeah, thank you for, for the webinar. It was uh, uh, illuminating. I also learned a few new things about Audit logs, I didn't know. Um, <laughs> well, never stop learning. Uh, well, there, there are a couple of questions uh, that, that in the, uh, throw in the chat. Uh, one is from Mauricio. Um, he's asking if this panel is native from Kubernetes. So the, the dashboard you showed are native from Kubernetes, or so you have to install something. 
No, so the dashboard that I saw is, is, is actually kind of an early version of Alcid Audit. So this is, if you want to get that, then uh, you should hit the link, the first link and, and kind of get that. Um, there is, uh, I think that there are some open source tools out there, um, even a CNCF1 Falco, that basically will enable you to plug um, kind of the audit stream and do some of the basic rules that are out there. But the more advanced stuff, the AI stuff, uh, um, you, you, you need kind of a specialized tool to, to do that. So K-Audit would be kind of one option uh, to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, a bunch of questions are popping up now. So let's start with Fabrice. Um, so Fabrice is asking if, uh, uh, say a, micro, a Java microservice with a reverse shell vulnerability was deployed on a node, how would this tool detect when an intruder gets unauthorized access with the node? So, so you get the question. So let's say that you are involuntarily deploying um, unsecure application and then you yes. through that. This is, great, right? this is a great question. So, uh, the, so actually there's a, there are two parts to kind of answer that. So. Um, it really depends what the attacker actually did. So let's say that I have a pod that basically was breached and someone kind of uh, created a reverse shell. So if the attacker uh, will try to kind of do the lateral movement inside the cluster to where my kind of assets, my data assets are through attempts to call the API server. So K-Audit will basically detect that because this, this would be kind of uh, um, captured using the AI and the anomaly detection. However, um, this is why I kind of in my first, uh, it was the first slide in this webinar, um, I mentioned that um, the runtime defenses require different type of security tooling or, or a security tool to cover. So the network security is not covered by the audit log. So essentially, if you want to cover kind of, or at least if you want to track down or hunt down um, an attacker, a sophisticated attacker that will kind of use uh, multiple channels to do the lateral movement and exfiltrate data, you will need to have more than one tool in your cluster. I think it's clear, yep. So it's a uh, key out is only integrating other tools. I mean, you need more than one tool to, to be. Of course. I mean, for protect. this type of attack, yes, for this type of attack, you will need more than one tool to detect kind of uh, a threat actor in the cluster. Um, another question from Mikola. Um, what is an idiomatic way to apply changes to a QBA audit policy to avoid a cluster disruption? So can you repeat the question? Like, what's the... Uh, idiomatic way. So I suppose the question is also about um, are changes applied to Kube audit uh, causing disruption in the operation of the cluster? So I, I would guess that, that uh, when, and this is something that happens a lot. I mean, we change the cluster. I mean, the cluster is pretty much a living creature. I mean, if you deploy a CRD, for example, and it creates a chain of events, uh, then the best kind of uh, the best way to kind of approach that is, is for example, if you want to monitor or, or at least detect disruptions that are associated with the misconfiguration, you want to track down the uh, permission denied kind of the 403 error code from the API server. So, for example, if your steady state uh, represents kind of zero 403 in your cluster, you did kind of a new deployment, and now the 403 uh, spiked, then this is something that would kind of flag you to see what happened in the last deployment uh, and whether this is uh, um, a configuration error. You can go to the audit log itself and look specific audit entries that has the 403 error code and then look at the actual resources that uh, fired them. So that would be kind of one motion of leveraging the, the audit log for uh, analysis, but it's not part of, so, so the, 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 the mechanics or the machinery around that is, I, I would say it's, it's pretty much, you need to tailor use cases to kind of, uh, if you want to do the static analysis. Um, if you employ, employ kind of uh, AI into that, um, a good AI will detect those anomalies uh, with relatively low, uh, low kind of uh, false positive rate. 
Okay, that uh, makes sense. Uh, the question was also uh, focused a bit more. So the question was more about um, if the updates to the Kube Audit policy needs restarting of the Kube, Kube API server. No, so uh, absolutely not. Um, as long as, so maybe there's one, so it really depends on which Kubernetes uh, um, service you use. If you use the uh, managed kind of GKE, EKS, and, and AKS and friends, uh, absolutely not. You just need to kind of turn this feature on and the logs will start to stream to the analyzer. Yeah, so I think there is also a related question. Uh, does this service run as a sidecar to every pod? But No, absolutely that. not. Uh, you need to deploy one cluster analyzer per cluster. Okay, great. Moving on to, uh, to other questions. So um, is there an integration with Prometheus? Yes, yeah, so we, we have some security metrics that are exposed from K-Audit. Um, it just, you need to kind of enable them. By default, we don't enable the security metrics pretty much because disclosing kind of security, um, um, let's say it, it's pretty much discloses kind of aspects of the security posture of your environment. So we've kind of sensitive or paranoid about that. That makes sense. But the, the, um, the short answer is yes. Okay, great. Yeah, it's a, it's a standard for, uh, for, for monitoring. The, another question is, what kind of database or storage is used to persist the audit logs? Um, so we don't actually persist the entire audit log. Luckily for us, um, we just store a, a digested version of the audit log. So the entire raw audit log is actually stored in your, normally that would be your cloud provider. So uh, stack driver, CloudWatch to S3 or, or AKS uh, to an Azure blob, whichever kind of mechanism you do. However, crunching the data is something that we um, kind of persist on the, uh, using actually stateful set to persist it on the node itself. And if you use kind of uh, um, a network attached storage, so it's, it's effectively outside the cluster. Okay. That's clear. Um, coming to the end of the question. So uh, a question about what is the advantage of using this over more traditional logging uh, systems like Splunk or uh, Elasticsearch? Great, great question. Um, so one of the main kind of differences that, uh, that, that K-Audit basically brings into the table, um, it, it was built like tailor-made analysis of the Kubernetes audit log, it pretty much captures or understands some basic or core concepts of, of Kubernetes itself. Like for example, um, what are nodes in the cluster or what are service accounts or what are users or, or how the APIs are being structured, what is resource. Um, and the way that the analysis is being done is that we pretty much build profiles for each and every user in the cluster and each and every resource and the entire cluster as a whole. And when you look at kind of gen generic tools like, like Elastic or Splunk, they would do kind of general kind of machine learning analysis that uh, uh, normally would yield more false positives, if at all, uh, versus, you know, something that is more tailor-made for, for Kubernetes. Okay. Well, we that's... Maybe, maybe just to add to that, that we can feed uh, external tools like Elastic and, and, and Splunk, um, pretty much feed them with detections or policy exceptions. So things like Splunk or El uh, Elasticsearch can act as a long-term storage for, uh, for the audit yes, logs. Correct, correct, right. correct. We, have, we have integration, for example, uh, with Datadog uh, and we ship all the findings that, uh, that we have as part of our system to uh, your Datadog dashboard. So you can consume K-Audit findings uh, in, in your Datadog dashboard. Oh, that's, uh, that's good to know. Uh, yeah, well, so I yes, you're gonna get, you can find the copy of the presentation deck. Um, I think it, it's uh, customary to, that it, you find it attached on, uh, on the YouTube. 
uh, recording, but uh, probably you can uh, you, you will get a copy of this presentation or if you yeah, can share. We can take care of that. Okay, so a few more, uh, sorry, I missed a few questions that is uh, there, they were on, um, on the regular chat. Um, does this work in a private cluster? Yes. That does, yes, can have it in a private, private setting. Yes. So you, you definitely don't need any internet connection or any yeah. public Air endpoint. Gap. Yeah. Air gapped environment is good enough. Okay. Is it easy to migrate with tools like Veledo when we have to migrate the cluster? I, as I interpret this is about um, if you can use backup tools like Veledo also with K-Audit. Um, I don't see any reason why not to. I mean, we are pretty much kind of think of us as, as kind of security infrastructure app inside your cluster. And if you can migrate any other application, I mean, Valero will basically take care of um, exporting your Vol data volumes and your pretty much resources. So that should be straightforward. Yeah, that's what I suppose as well. So, well, this kind of uh, exhausts all the question. If there's any very last minute question, please type it now. Otherwise I will, uh, I will thank our speakers for today. Uh, and it's very good job. And uh, it was great to learn a few more things about audit logs. And I'm looking for, I sign up for the, for the, for the preview. So I hope uh, to nice. kick the ties <laughs> of this pretty soon. Nice. Thank you everybody for, uh, yes, thank you for, uh, for attending. Uh, and I will see you soon. Looking forward to see you soon at a future CNCF webinar, which I think is uh, next week. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, everyone.